Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. And welcome to our first virtual format Ida Hobbit Day event. Um, we have people joining us from both inside the organisation and outside for this morning tea. Hope you brought your, your couple with you, um, as well as um, some members of the broader community. So thanks for joining us. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge the land upon which uh, we're broadcasting on and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land, both past, present and emerging. Um, many of you already know that we are in fact celebrating 30, uh, 30th anniversary this year of when, on May the 17th, 1990, the World Health Organisation removed homosexuality from the classification of diseases and related health problems. This specific date on May the 17th was then marked as a day of recognition and celebration known as the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Interphobia and Transphobia or as we know it now, Ida Hobbit, celebrating LGBTIQ plus people globally and raising awareness for the work that still needs to be done to combat discrimination and inequality. The no. guests who are more than thrilled to be able to introduce to you all shortly will share with us their lived experiences of LGBTIQ plus advocacy, anti-discrimination, creating inclusive communities and what the future holds. There will be a time to ask questions at the end, so I please really encourage all of you to use the chat function um, on, on Zoom to start logging your questions. But before I, we, we hand over to the guests, it might be important to give another perspective on Ida Hobbit and its origins, one that is much older than the 30 years. Whilst I'm confident many of you already know the origin of Ida Hobbit being the World Health Organisation classification, you may not know why May the 17th was the date chosen. For a long time in Europe, May 17 was unofficially labelled as Gay Day because when written in the date of 17th slash 5, it had a natural affinity with paragraph 175 of the Penal Code in Germany that, that criminalised homosexuality. Records of thousands upon thousands of people charged under this law were then used during World War II to persecute, imprison, and in many cases, murder homosexuals. The date was reclaimed as a reminder of the importance of inclusion and the impact of othering behaviours when we treat people as other than ourselves. And it's also important to remember that Ida Hobbit is not one single campaign, and nor should it be the only time that we work towards inclusive practice. Today is just a moment when thousands of ideas and initiatives converge over a single vision, freedom and equality for all sexual, gender and body minorities. And with that, I'm so happy to be able to introduce our first speaker, Ro Allen, Commissioner for Gender and Sexuality since 2015. Ro is an experienced and long-standing advocate for LGBTIQ plus Victorians and has held leadership positions in both community and government sectors. Ro has been a member of three Victorian government LGBTQI plus ministerial advisory groups and chaired the Ministerial Advisory Committee on LGBTI Health and Wellbeing between 2007 and 2009. Thank you and welcome to Ro. Thank you and thank you for having me. I come from uh, land of the Yorta Yorta and I want to acknowledge uh, the first peoples of this country and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, thank you for that uh, most detailed background, Ida Hobbit, and I've learned something as the Commissioner for Gender and Sexuality. I see Aram nodding too, I didn't know that, about um, May 17. So I knew the World Health Organization had removed homosexuality as disease, but um, I'm gonna get a copy of that from you, that was fantastic. I'll look very knowledgeable to the rest of the community now. Uh, so the brief I've had today for Jewish care is um, unsurprising. You, you're wanting a bit of a personal piece, which um, I think is, uh, it's, it's refreshing. Um, so I'll, I'll do that. I'll, but I just, before I do that, I want, to, um, I want to do a shout out to you all about getting your Rainbow Tick accreditation. Uh, that's not something you get on a Wheaties packet, Bill, is it? So um, you got to work really hard for that. <laughs> Uh, as, as many of you would know, and it's a big achievement. And I'm, I'm sorry that COVID uh, has meant that perhaps you haven't been able to party hard about that. Um, but, you know, I, I've noticed it, others have noticed it. And, and 
we notice a lot of the things the Jewish community do and come out and do first before others. Um, certainly with the um, conversion practice piece of work that I'm working on right at the moment, uh, Jewish care was, or Jewish community and broadly in Jewish care were the, pretty much the first out of the docks to support it and say, um, you know, praying away the gay is not okay. Um, and I want to acknowledge that you've stood for the minorities for so long uh, and supported our community. It's been amazing. So perhaps preaching to the converted with this group today. Um, but anyway, I'll try and keep to my 15 minutes so Aram gets, um, gets a bit of a crack. But uh, I was reflecting last night about how I got into LGBTI advocacy. And frankly, um, I could dish up a lot of stories, but it was a complete accident is the truth. Uh, I moved to um, I moved to Shepparton for uh, a 12 month position just to, to round out my CV as a youth worker to get rural and regional on there. Um, and um, I was working um, for the World Council of Churches overseas at a conference and they asked me about, um, you know, as a young thing, they asked me about rural young people and um, I didn't have that on my CV. So I came back to do 12 months in Shepparton and um, I turned up and they put me on wind television, which I think still exists in rural and regional Victoria, I'm not sure. Um, as the new youth worker in town. And the following week, I had three gay and lesbian, it was then, um, gay and lesbian kids come into my office and say, thank goodness you're here. Um, we need to start a youth group. So once I rubbed the tattoo off my head, um, you know, we got on with it. And and I suppose that's, that's really what I realised. There was absolutely nothing for young people in rural Victoria. And the advocacy journey that I had to, to go through was, um, was born at that point. So, you know, I, I was physically beaten. I had my car um, scratched up. I had lemons thrown on the roof of my house in the middle of the night, uh, all those lovely things. And, I, and it actually, I think it, it does something to someone. It, you either go one way or the other. You either back off or it makes you go harder. And I'm, I'm uh, I suppose, the person that made me go harder. So not only did I set up that group, I got it incorporated. Um, uh, and uh, and then I thought, well, wow, if this is happening in Shepparton, this is happening all over Victoria, and um, went down and uh, I'm, I'm sure no one's recording this, but took over the Youth Affairs Council of Victoria as the chair so I could set up a, a statewide network of rural and regional support groups, um, which was hard because we, we weren't even talking about, same, then it was same-sex attracted young people. We weren't even talking about trans and non-binary and intersex back then. Um, that's, um, that, there was a great gang there that supported in doing that. And we set up, um, a, a statewide network and did training back in the day. And, um, you know, I remember going out to rural areas and, and, you know, people saying, well, we don't have that disability here. You know, that's, that's how archaic we were back, back in the day. Um, and so that's now turned into what we know as the Hay program in Victoria, which has been supported by both governments in Victoria. I mean, I was really lucky then. Um, I was um, able to work with the, um, the National Human Rights Commissioner, Chris Sidoti at the time, and we set up a project called Outlink, which was looking at rural and regional same-sex attracted people all over Australia. Uh, and from there, you know, I thought, well, we've got to get this embedded in government. And we, we worked really hard to set up what was Australia's first Ministry Advisory Committee, what was... Um, in Department of Human Services, it was gay and lesbian health. It wasn't even lesbian and gay back then. It was the other way around. It didn't have all the other alphabet on it. And um, we were a minister advisory committee. The fact that we were attached onto the back of food and hygiene in DHHS and we met in the basement didn't matter. We were real and we thought we were Christmas. And um, it grew from there. The second one, uh, I was fortunate enough to chair and it, it grew um, to be health and wellbeing of LGBTI. And it was a hybrid model where we had um, department directors and community members. And we really got traction at that point. And it was the first time we had a sort of whole of government um, LGBTI, or well, not whole of government, whole of health um, LGBTI focused statement. So, you know, it just sort of grew accidentally out of my own experience, I suppose. Um, and then before that, or around the same time as that, um, uh, I, I, um, I looked to, to ministry. So I, I was formed and born into the Uniting Church. And that's, that's where I got my social justice uh, grounding, I suppose, and grew up as a teenager in the prison support group and South African support group and everything else. And 
was um, was heading into uh, what I thought was a life of ministry, and um, and then my sexuality was a bit of a, a bit of a hurdle. So I ended up uh, being the first out um, lesbian at the time to candidate openly for ministry in the Uniting Church. So that um, don't ask me any year. I have no. I can tell you what everybody was wearing and the smell in the room and how sunny the day was, but I can't tell you what year it was. It's a crazy thing about my memory, but um, whatever year that was it's written down somewhere, um, created a lot of media storm about um, being an out uh, lesbian candidating for ministry. Um, I was actually accepted, um, but then deferred when ABC Compass was um, chasing me around to, um, to get my story. And that's when I started uh, Uniting Care, uh, cutting edge up in, um, up in Shepparton. So that was sort of the, the story, really. Um, and then a quick jump forward in how I became the commissioner. Well, I went on with the rest of my career and was a commissioner in the employment and skills area. And when this position was created, I thought, well, I just pretty much need to elbow every other possible person out of the running and um, apply for this. So I worked out who the other five people might be. And I had coffee with four of them and said, would you support me in my application? Um, and they could see I was pretty damn keen. So. I just feel like um, for me, this is um, as, as commissioner and seeing when you say 2015, that just seems like sometimes that seems like a minute ago and sometimes that seems like a life ago. But um, I've been really proud of what the Victorian government has been able to do in the last five years. Um, we've changed a lot of laws. We've, um, we've done a lot of training. We've put a lot of money out. We're building Australia's first pride centre. Um, I think overall we're close to forty million dollars into LGBTI initiatives um, since um, since the Andrews government came into office. Um, so I, unfortunately, I'm still the only commissioner in Australia. Um, Victoria is the only state that has one. Um, there's a few other states kicking tires around, but um, and watching the success or not of of what we're doing in Victoria, um, and we're trying to share it broadly and globally. But um, yeah, accidental commissioner. But really happy to um, talk more and answer any questions on any of that. I haven't talked much about the government. I should probably talk about what we're doing right now. Just a quick list. Um, Aaron's laughing at me. Uh, I did say I'd do that. Uh, as I mentioned, um, before COVID, we were going into um, a piece of legislation around conversion um, ideology. And that will come back on the table. We're looking at the Equal Opportunity Act uh, broadly. Uh, and that'll be the pretty much the last two pieces of legislation to get us um, to get us across the line. Building the Pride Centre, as I said, we're developing a roadmap for rural and regional communities, which is the combination of the whole rural and roadshow that I've been doing for the last four years. Uh, where um, I suppose the big ticket item is we're doing a whole of government LGBTI strategy. So that's the first time we've had a whole of government, not just health. It's you know policing and environment and the whole eight departments plus all the agencies of government uh, whole um, consultation strategy which I'm sure um, it, I expect lots of submissions from yourselves uh, about what we should be doing and that will set the um, set the benchmark but also set the roadmap for the next 10 years of how we're going to get to LGBTIQ plus inclusion. Um, there's a big piece of work we're doing around the intersex community which is just sitting at um, the health minister's office uh, for sign off. She's been a bit busy uh, in the last couple of months. So that's a bit of a bit of a hold up there. She's a few things on um, Jen Makakos, but we're expecting to watch this space because we'll be doing a whole lot of things around um, the intersex area. And of course, we've just achieved um, the birth uh, deaths and marriages reform. So in Victoria, from the 1st of May, uh, you could register your change of gender without surgery and a whole lot of other uh, parts of that. So there's been, um, there's been quite a bit on. We're still doing a lot of work in the family violence, LGBTIQ space, and, and the work will go on. And um, we know that during COVID, um, you know, inequalities are magnified during a crisis. So we've had um, lots of extra work to do in that space. I'm sure that's my time well and truly up, but really happy to answer questions later on in the day. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Sorry, everyone. Lots of background noise. Thanks so much, Ro. Um, I'm not sure about your uh, kind of comment on accidental. I think there was a lot of purposeful activity going on to get you to where you were. Um, and I think we've all been uh, rewarded, um, unfortunately, by the impact of negative um, experiences that you've had because I guess what, what you've said is they've kind of 
hardened you up and I think we've been rewarded by you uh, being able to elbow your way um, accidentally, apparently, to, to where you are now. So um, thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. There are some questions coming through, but we will hold them off till um, we finish with our next speaker. So please feel free to keep um, adding some of the questions to the chat uh, function in the, in the uh, Zoom. Um, I also now want to um, introduce to you our second speaker, Aaron Hosey. Um, Aram is nationally uh, recognised um, as a transgender advocate and queer leader, accomplished writer, speaker and freelance consultant. Um, this is the first time I've met Aram, so I am reading a bio. Um, so he's held, um, Aram, Aram's held many positions in this space, including Director of Engagement at Equality Australia and as an executive with CoHealth, currently working as the Head of Strategic Communications at the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. Thank you, Aaron, and Aaron, and over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I assume you're able to see and hear me. I'm gonna... Excellent, fantastic. All right, so before I start, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the, the traditional owners of the various lands that we're all sitting on as we meet today and pay my respect to their elders, um, past, present, and emerging. And also to recognise that you know the, the sovereignty was never ceded over the lands that we live and work and play on every day, and that Aboriginal people have demonstrated incredible resilience um, in the face of some some epic adversity ever since uh, ever since colonialisation. Um, like Roe, I suppose I was an accidental activist too. Right? It wasn't my intention to to grow up and become a uh, nationally recognised trans advocate. That wasn't ever in my life plan. Um, I, I cut my teeth in terms of learning how to advocate really nearly 20, 20 years ago now, back in Western Australia, actually, in 2000, 2001. It was at the time that WA was uh, introducing reforms to uh, equalise the age of consent for gay men, to provide a degree of relationship recognition to people in same-sex relationships, uh, through de facto laws, and also actually to introduce quite a lot of uh, parenting recognition and, and access to IVF um, for couples. So 20 years ago, WA's laws were some of the best in the country. In fact, um, WA did a fantastic job then. Uh, they've got a little catching up now to do other states, particularly here in Victoria, we've very much overtaken uh, WA, but at the time they were very significant reforms and I was a baby, uh, very much learning the ropes for my elders who had been at that campaign for a long time and were finally able to celebrate success. What then happened really for me was that when I was 23, I transitioned and at the time my then partner was a federal senator. Uh, we'd had a reasonable bit of visibility before that as being a lesbian couple. So it was quite difficult to hide the fact that her girlfriend had turned into her boyfriend. Um, there was not really an option for me to be stealth or anything other than out about my, about my transition. Um, it was confusing to some people. We had a funny moment with the then premier of Western Australia. We were at an event with him and his wife. I was, my voice was breaking, I was pimply. He knew that my partner was a lesbian, so he thought I was her son. Uh, he was corrected by his wife. He said, no, 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 that's Louise's very butch girlfriend. Of course, the truth was kind of somewhere in between their two perceptions. Uh, but so there was a reasonable amount of confusion about what was happening and a lot of interest, uh, including from the media. So even though I was quite early in my transition, uh, the media, the media pretty much decided that they would write a story on me, uh, whether we cooperated or not. Uh, and so after having put them off for as long as we possibly could, uh, we ended up co cooperating with a particular journalist. And so one Saturday morning, I walked in to uh, get the morning coffees and found myself on the, the front page of the state's um, West Australian newspaper. Uh, big picture of me and the title, Senator's Sex Swap Partner. Uh, and lots of double takes from people in the cafe as I walked in and got my coffees and scampered back home pretty quickly and didn't really leave the house for the rest of that day. Uh, so I was thrust, I think it would be fair to say, into kind of having, having quite a public role. And remembering that this was a time that was before anyone had heard of Laverne Cox or Caitlin Jenner or Catherine McGregor. 
um, and was in Western Australia. So the idea of trans people existing, and in particular a trans man existing, um, was quite, quite kind of foreign to people. No one knew about it. There was a lot of curiosity about it. The other thing that I realised in transitioning from being essentially a lesbian to a to, to being trans was that I lost rights. So after those fantastic law reforms that WA had introduced in 2000, 2001, by, I gained male privilege, fantastic, but I lost a whole bunch of other uh, legal rights. So as a lesbian, I could, access mental, I could access mental health and medical services that I needed. As a trans person, in order to access transition um, related medical care, that was only available through the private health system. So you had to be pretty privileged and have some money to be able to, to just access your basic healthcare. Um, my identity was no longer my own. The, the state had an opinion about who I said I was. And at that time, you couldn't change your documentation. I couldn't change my birth certificate. I couldn't change passports. Um, my documents continued to list me as female when I very clearly wasn't. Uh, the discrimination protection that I had as a lesbian and in a same-sex couple, I had far less discrimination protection as a trans man. Um, so it was a stark kind of shock to see that that by my, my physical body changing and me becoming the person that I really was, I suddenly was a human being with a whole lot of less rights in the, in the world. Uh, so this is really where the accidental activism happened, I guess. I was already out. There was no, there was no pretending like that wasn't me. Um, for the rest of my life, anyone who Googles my name will know that. Uh, so the combination of already being out, of being in a relatively privileged position, um, of having some political access by virtue of my partner meant that I, I kind of fell into, into advocacy. Um, and so I've been incredibly, I think, incredibly privileged to be involved in a range of campaigns over that time. And the world has changed really significantly for trans people. So I'm confident now that with the exception of maybe a couple of, of outlets. Nobody would ever write a story about someone being a sex swap anyone. Um, I think the media, whilst there is still a long way to go, has really shifted in its understanding and its language. Uh, the laws around Australia are still quite patchy around um, people's ability to change their documentation, but certainly here in Victoria we've got some of the best uh, legislation in the country. And we've seen many other states also reform. So New South Wales still needs to catch up. So does Western Australia, uh, but the Northern Territory, South Australia, um, the ACT, Tasmania, all have really great legislation now, which enables people to change their, their details. Uh, passports have also changed. I was um, happy to be involved in that campaign. And I saw through that the power of personal story, in fact. The backstory to how that happened was that Kevin Rudd was the foreign minister at that time. He had um, been, been demoted uh, and he had a couple of uh, constituents of his visit him in, in his electorate office. They were trans women who happened to live in his electorate and they came and they talked to him about their experiences just as being trans women navigating the world. And he was so moved by what he heard that he came back to his department and said, well, in my portfolio, what can we do? And the only thing that he could do in his portfolio really was passports. And that was where then the passport um, change came from, from him looking for a way to make a positive difference after hearing personal stories from people within his electorate. Um, the other reason that I think passport reform happened so successfully at the time that it did was that there was an alliance of activists who worked on that and worked in cooperation with government. And so I also saw the incredible benefits that come from working in allyship and working with government. Sometimes you need to, sometimes you need to yell at government a little bit, uh, but also sometimes working with government and together trying to come up with a good solution. Being a bit inside the tent can be incredibly important for getting things done. Of course, a lot has changed, but a lot hasn't as well. And I sometimes say that I think uh, trans rights are about 20, 30 years behind, behind rights for gay and lesbian people. Um, and in fact, where we started talking about the declassification of homosexuality as a mental illness is a case in point, because it wasn't until last year that the trans experience was declassified as a mental illness. So up until 2019, until last year, uh, being trans was still considered to be a mental illness. When I transitioned, step one was go see a psychiatrist and get that diagnosis essentially of, of yes, you are uh, 
I can't remember the terminology at the time, but you have, you know, gender identity disorder. You are disordered, and on the basis of your disorder, you can now go and access, access care. So that was a significant change from the World Health Organization, but it came 20 years after the change uh, to the classification of homosexuality. And whilst that was a significant change last year, uh, seeing it actually in, become implemented in practice is something that is still very much in the early stages. Um, trans people are, and also people with intersex um, variations, but we are too often pathologized uh, ongoingly within the, within the medical um, system and broader systems as well. And so too many other people have opinions about what we should do with our lives and our bodies and what care we are and are not entitled to. Um, so it continues to be this real battle to uh, have self-determination and bodily integrity and be able to access the care that we need in a way that's non-pathologizing and says there's something wrong with us. Um, the thing that I find most disturbing really is that the reality is that all over the world being trans can still cost you your life. Um, in many, many countries around the world, uh, trans people, particularly trans women, particularly trans women of colour, and particularly trans women of colour who may be engaged in sex work, uh, run the risk of incredible violence being directed towards them and, and often murder and, and brutal, brutal murders too. We have the Trans Day of Remembrance once a year and the numbers of people that have been murdered the year before <coughs> that we know about are always incredibly distressing. Um, here in Australia, there's less likelihood of you being murdered for, you being tra for being trans. Uh, instead, we kill ourselves. So the reality is the statistics show that close to one in two trans people in this country will have attempted suicide. It's attempted suicide, not thought about it, but actually attempted it. Um, and all of the ongoing research that we see coming out, looking at the mental health of the LGBTIQ community broadly, but in particular looking at trans and gender diverse people shows that the indicators around mental health are not getting better, they're getting worse. So even as law reform is slowly progressing and we're seeing some reforms, the mental health indicators are getting worse. And that's because we're existing in a world that continues to tell us that we are wrong, continues to pathologize us, um, continues to be very discriminatory. And we see it play out in the, we saw it play out in the safe schools debate. We see it when um, the marriage alliance, having lost the marriage equality war, quickly rebranded to be Binary Australia, with the sole purpose, essentially, of fighting um, against trans people having, having rights. When you come up against those kinds of messages in the media and that kind of adverse, um, adversity day after day, it is not a wonder that so many trans people um, really struggle with their, with their mental health. And so I guess when I reflect on those opening remarks about how today is an uh, important day, both for celebration and for reflecting on what we still need to do and thinking about the impacts of discrimination, um, for me, that's the real the challenge and the mission going forward. Um, I, want, I won't feel like our work is done until that headline statistic of one in two trans people uh, attempting suicide shifts very dramatically. As long as that is a statistic that is, is that exists, it means that the world is not a safe place for trans and, and gender diverse people. And so I think I'd really encourage folks, um, not, to, not just today, but every day to think about um, when we're thinking about combating discrimination in particular, what can we do for trans and gender diverse people who uh, don't yet enjoy the same, the same safety and the same security as other members of the community. Um, and it's every, small things like getting people's name right and using the correct pronoun through to calling out transphobia um, and also just a whole range of kind of gender stereotypes and, and nasty kind of sexist and patriarchal attitudes that all feed in together to create a world that is not very safe for folks. So there are small and large things that we can do. Um, I'm confident when we look at how much has changed in 20 years that we can, we can change the world even more over the next 20 years, but there is still a way to go. I went in there, because you want to go to questions? Uh, thank, thanks so much, Aaron. Um, it's, I really appreciate you sharing your, your personal experience and you've kind of really reminded us all that whilst we're celebrating um, uh, Ida Hobbit today, there's still a lo long way to go in terms of uh, gaining uh, rights around equality um, and recognition. So um, it's 
thank you very much for doing that. Um, I'm going to open up to questions, and there are a lot, and I'm going to be looking at the screen across, but I might start off with the first uh, question that uh, goes to Ro. Um, and it, the question's asking about whether you're working a lot in schools these days as well. So, no, I don't um, directly go into schools um, per se. Um, I work, I have worked in the last five years to make sure we keep safe schools alive and well and going. Um, uh, and um, it's, it's sad to, I mean, it's, it's good and sad to say that um, every state school in Victoria is a safe school, um, but the minus 18 research we had commissioned that not every LGBTIQ young person in a state school knows their school is a safe school. Um, so there's still work that we're doing in schools. Um, we're also doing a piece of work uh, in post compulsory education now through um, we're auditing the TAFE colleges because many young people who drop out of school who are LGBTIQ or just the general community uh, are in TAFE colleges or learn locals across Victoria. Sorry about those cockies. You can, I don't know if you can hear the cockies in the background. They're very, they're very loud. I might need to shut the door. Um, they're coming to eat my fruit off my fruit trees. Um, so uh, school's very important. I, I got to see a lot of school videos um, that schools have made for Idaho Hobbit yesterday and I, I, the, the tears were pouring out of my eyes. Teachers that had made videos um, for their kids in isolation for Idaho Hobbit and there were just lots of them and I just thought, wow, you know, things are really changing. Um, but, you know, a young person's experience isn't changing. It's still pretty much the same, you know, dealing and coming out. Um, when I was um, when I was young, and when you know, and and as it is for them now, it's they just do it differently. Many of them do it on TikTok. You know, they come out in, in different ways than we did. I just um, I remember Aaron. I loved your story about the newspaper. I just the funniest one um, for me was um, I was in the age which you know, very large newspaper. Um, half the half the age was my face, um, page three, and um, my partner at the time hadn't come out. Um, or had said that she had a partner, um, and her mother had been reading the age, and she said, "Well, actually, if you turn to page three, there's my partner." And um, so it's it's funny. I mean, I've still got that newspaper. I'm sure you've still got the newspaper, Aram. Yeah, but um, you know, they do they do make a break here. That's for sure. Thanks, Ro. Um, I've got a question now for Aaron, um, and I'll read it out so that I don't uh, do it any uh, injustice. But Ida Hobbit reminds us of broader inequalities across society as much as it sheds light, light on LGBTI experiences. Are you able perhaps to share with us your experiences of differences in the way people have treated you now since your transition um, compared to previous, uh, previously presenting the cis, as a cis female? Yeah, this, this is a question that I get asked and it does, um, it's something that I've spoken about and it's, it's fascinating. I remember when I first transitioned, I was working um, in juvenile justice spaces and spent a lot of time working with police. And the, at the point when I was being read as male, I'd be in a room often with other male police officers and I would see the way the conversation would shift the minute a woman walked into the room. I felt like a spy. I was like, I see what's going on here. You don't know that I know, but I like, I, I felt like I felt like a spy into, into secret men's business. Um, they didn't really know that I was watching what was, was going on. Um, so it was quite an odd period of adjustment, actually quite early in transition to, I needed to learn some new things about how to socialize within a, within a male body, but also was incredibly aware of uh, my privilege and what I now had access to and, and observing how things were really different. So, so absolutely there's, I, um, I make use of, and I'm very aware of there's this weird instant camaraderie thing that sometimes happens between men that I don't see happen when, when women and men meet in a, in a kind of a workplace um, kind of context. It's a bit boys clubby type thing. Uh, and yeah, I think the reality of that is that does give men a certain immediate kind of in and advantage that women have to work a little bit harder to establish from a relationship perspective. I'm not sure I see women do the same thing with other women. So it's, it's a, it's a bit of a patriarchy looking after itself thing, I think. 
Um, the biggest one for me though, to be honest, is around physical safety. So that recognition that I am still the same human being, but in a different body. But now when I walk down the street at night, I am no longer walking down the street thinking about how do I make sure I don't get myself raped or kidnapped or murdered. But instead I am perceived by other women in the street as being a potential rapist. And noting that women, you know, I can't walk too close to a woman who's walking. This is back when we used to be able to be out in our houses doing things at night time, but I could not be on the street walking too close to another woman because she'd get nervous and she'd move. Um, and so now I do things to try and signal I'm not a threat, I'm not a threat. And it really shocked me in a way that all men, people say not all men, but because of the behavior of too many men, by virtue of being a man, you are immediately a potential threat to to women um and the difference of course versus having been socialized as female when you grow up and you take care of yourself and you think about how to look after your safety and it was shocking to me to realize just how how bad the violence um against women by men is that that by virtue of moving through the world as a man you are you are a threat so i've had some conversations with straight men about this because they don't really realize those those differences they kind of know it you know cerebral sort of way but to really say the lived experience of this is particularly at night time in terms of how that how that looks and feels is that men are just automatically a threat that women need to protect themselves from so that was that was one of the the greatest and starkest things that i still grapple with and that still hits me around the head just that experience of the, th the threat to women's safety from from men um and and the seriousness which with which men are taken just by virtue of being men so i can say things now that i would have said as a woman and i would have been dismissed as a like angry cranky lesbian man hater blah 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 I say the same thing now call out a man for his behavior and i'm taken far more seriously potentially can come also with the risk of, of physical violence because you don't hit women but you can hit men um, but I've got some good how to verbally de-escalate skills because I was raised female. So it's these funny ways that the world kind of interacts around that in many ways I'm, phys in many ways I'm physically safer, uh, but in some other ways I'm exposed to new physical risks, but I've still got some skills because I was raised female and how to use your words and keep yourself safe that men kind of don't have. Um, and I continue sometimes to feel, even though I've now been transitioned for a long time, um, I do continue to sometimes feel a bit like a spy when I see the way men behave um, around women, not around women, uh, when they're just with each other. It's, it is, we do have a long way to go, actually, on, on gender equality is the short, the short answer of that. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. There is so much in what you said then that I've got about a thousand questions and a thousand comments to make, but I will hold off because there are more questions. So I'll just um, ask Ro the next one. Um, the, uh, one of the writers asked whether the Pride Centre is looking great. Um, when do you expect it to be completed and what type of services will it provide for the community? So um, October. Uh, we, obviously, we're going to hold off the party uh, until next year uh, when we can all physically get together. Uh, hopefully, we can next year. Uh, it'll have, it, it's going to be very exciting as well as, you know, cafe and bar. It's going to have uh, Thorn Harbour Health uh, and Equinox for trans folk. Um, it's going to have a, you know, legal offering, I hope. It's going to have minus 18 switchboard. Um, Joy Radio will be operating LGBTI radio from there. Uh, the archives, which is the, the national um, gay and lesbian archives that they're credited, they're going to be moving in there as well. So we'll be able to get access to our history um, in a way we haven't before. Um, and then and then there's a whole lot of working spaces where people will be able to, other organisations will be able to work in that space as well. So it's going to be um, a hype of activity, I think, um, as, soon as, um, as soon as possible. Uh, Star Health is moving in. There's a whole um, the list. Uh, queer film are moving in, and transgender Victoria. So, it's it, it's going to be tight. Um, uh, but you know, I think it's being built for organisations that don't even exist yet. You know, uh, it, it'll be here for 20 years, um, and uh, you know, I expect it'll be a great community place. It'll have a theatreette, so we'll be able to have uh, events and functions and webinars. Um, and of course, there's also the virtual pride center that goes with it, the, the page. So, you know, I'm expecting, um, expecting it'll be, people will gradually move in, 
uh, as we do the social distancing thing is, but you know, definitely by the end of the year, um, it, it'll be finished. And if you drive past it now, it just looks so impressive from the outside. Thanks, Ro, absolutely. We look forward to seeing it all emerge and uh, it will be a hub of a whole lot of information that would hopefully uh, also help uh, with changes that are required still. Um, Aram, another question for you. Um, what movement has there been in the medical field for trans folk to be able to access gender affirming surgery? And do you think there is room in our socialised health system to have scope for that to be added? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think the short answer is there's not been enough movement on surgery. I feel like surgery is a little too often put in the too hard basket. Um, it's not to say that trans folks can't access uh, some surgeries here in Australia, um, but they are largely through the private health system and so largely require people to have health insurance or find other ways to fund it. Lots and lots of folks raid their superannuation um, and get early release of super in order to pay for surgery. So there are some surgeons operating in Australia. They do a great job. Um, not all surgeries are available in the country and there was a great irony when there was very specific surgical requirements for um, for the change of legal documentation that you couldn't actually have those surgeries in the country so it was the law was essentially requiring people to leave the country have surgery in order to be able to come back to the country and, and reform change their birth certificate um, so not everything is available and certainly very very little is available in the public health system um, it's a complicated issue, as I understand it. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on all things um, Medicare and billing items and the way that hospitals are run. But as I understand it, there are Medicare codes that should theoretically enable these surgeries to happen within our hospitals. But we need hospitals to be willing to make operating space and, and rooms available for that to happen. And we need to have surgeons who are appropriately qualified and working and willing to work within the public health system. So I feel like it's often in the slightly too hard basket, actually making some progress. It's kind of seen as something that there's not that, there's not that many surgeries and most people kind of manage to sort it out. And so it's, it's a low priority, um, but it is one that I think we do need to try and, and make some progress on. And it should theoretically be doable within our, our health system. It just it just requires those things about kind of hospitals and and expertise and billing to all line up. Thanks, Aaron. Um, we've probably got time for two more questions. So there's two in the chat uh, pool. One's a bit one's a little political and one's much more personal. So I might just start with the political, and it's to both um, Aaron and Ro. Um, how do you think we can address the overly heteronormative experience of sport? and increase LGBTI plus uh, visibility, openness, and celebration. Um, I, think, um, I think we're working on it. So certainly pride in sport uh, through um, ACON and uh, Proud to Play. They're two groups that are working really hard, um, certainly for trans and gender inclusivity in sport. And there's obviously intersex issues as well. Um, I've worked with the AFL and there's not a bad policy for, for community football um, and the AFL executive are like fantastic now. Um, for my penance, I've had to go to the Brownlow and a few other things. So, you know, um, if they told me I had to go to so many sports things, before, I've mean, never been to a sports game in my life before being commissioner. Um, now I flip more coins at games than you could possibly imagine. But, you know, there's now... Um, uh, Rainbow Roller Derby, which is the most scary. It might be um, emotionally inclusive, but it's incredibly physically dangerous. Um, and, you know, there's Roller Derby, you know, there's Roller Derby. Um, uh, what else have I done? Ice hockey. Um, all the codes are really uh, soccer. We've played a game of soccer between the police and the LGBTI community for a while. I think it's just about con continuing to educate and break down stigma. You know, I don't think it's about an AFL person coming out or um, any of the ladly stuff being helpful at all. Um, I think it's really just about getting the leadership and the local coaches at the local levels to understand what the issues are and put really good policies code by code um, into it. And we've certainly been supporting organisations to do that. Um, and I've 
you know, worked with Cricket Australia, Hockey Australia, Basketball Australia, um, particularly around policies around trans and gender diverse. And now it's about education, education, education. Aram, do you want to add anything to that? No, I'm happy to leave it at that. That's okay. Okay. So, um, uh, I have a private message that's come through saying uh, that Ajax potentially is marching at the 2021 Pride. So thank you all for uh, sending that bit of information. That's another bit of uh, very exciting to have Ajax come join us. Um, given that today was um, a, an offering for us to not only celebrate um, LGBTIQ+, plus, um, uh, uh, um, as a celebration, sorry, on a higher Hobbit day, but also um, we asked Ro and Aram to uh, talk a little bit about their own personal experiences. So I thought it'd be really nice to end this session on a question that is a very personal question written by somebody. So uh, I might that put that to you uh, before we end the session. And this is for both Ro and Aram. Um, any advice on coming out to friends and family? I want them to know, but I'm scared to have that conversation with them. Go on, Aaron. There's no right way is where I would, is where I would start with. Um, there's no right way and it is scary. I think sharing any really personal information about yourself with people that you care about is scary. So I would start with, with kind of really honoring the fact that it's a scary thing to do and saying that there are, there are lots of different ways to, to do it. Um, oh, in terms of, I mean, I don't, I don't know the person or their, or their circumstances, so I'm reluctant to give advice, but I guess I've, I've done it in lots of different ways. When I transitioned at work, it was a, an email that went out to my colleagues that talked, focused on my change of name and had a subtle change of pronoun at the beginning and the end of the name and out of the email and that was all it took and it was a kind of a low-key way but people got it and went from there um my parents are really religious i don't have a relationship with them because they're not okay with who i am but when i tra when i transitioned i wrote them a letter I, I wanted them to know i knew they wouldn't be okay with it but it was important that they know so i wrote them a letter and sent that and sent that to them um, when I came out as a lesbian, I knew that I was going to get rejected. And so I actually spent all of my time making sure I had good supports around me in, in preparation for that coming up. Um, so thinking about if it's not, if it, if it has the potential to not go great, then what will you do to look after yourself? Because that's really, really important. Make sure that you're ready to do it and you've got good support around you. Um, if you think that maybe they're going to need a little time, sometimes recognizing you've been sitting with this for a long time and you know who you are and you've been working up to this big conversation. And this might be the first that they've heard of it or thought about it. And sometimes people need a little time. My sister declared that I would always be her sister and she would never change on that until it just got too weird for her to keep referring to me as her sister. And she just naturally shifted. Um, so sometimes people need a little time. Um, and oftentimes people surprise you. So sometimes we can think this is going to be huge news and really scared about it. And sometimes people are like, yeah, I knew. Or or I didn't know, or I didn't know, but I love you. And it does, it just, none, none of it matters. So it's really hard to know how these things are going to go. And I think it's just about making sure that you're in, you're personally in the best possible place. Um, you've got a bit of a plan and a plan B potentially. Um, and there is no right or wrong way to, to do this. It's what feels like it's going to work best for you and the people around you, I think. Yep. I couldn't have, I couldn't have said that better. I think the only thing I'd add is, don't lock in the first thing that the person says to you is the only thing that they're on a journey as well. If I think about when I told my sister, she said, Oh yuck, that's disgusting. And now she's a lesbian. Um, you know, like you just don't lock everybody in my, my father, this is probably going to scare my father had a physical heart attack. Um, the day after he went on to live for 20 years, you know, and, um, nursed, um, his grandchild and, you know, loved my partner. And, you know, so, I just think you got to remember you might have been on a journey and you might need to take them on a journey, but don't lock in the first thing um, that they say. <laughs> lock in if it's great, but if it's negative, just, you know, brush it off as Aram said, have some more supports because, um, you know, it, it, everyone's on a, you know, everyone's on a journey. Thank you so much. And on that note, uh, I think we all are on a journey. Um, 
uh, as we kind of um, both celebrate Ida Hobbit today, but also reflect on our own either personal experiences, personal biases, and how we would like to see the world to be. I'm very proud to be working at Jewish Care and for us to have spent this morning with you all um, celebrating Ida Hobbit. And I really very much appreciate Ro and Aram for uh, sharing with us your personal journey, um, the political landscape, and certainly the way forward that we all are journeying together, hopefully. So thanks, everybody. Um, lovely to see you. And keep celebrating Ida Hobbit. Thanks very much. Bye.